Okay, um, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you to the third webinar of the APS COVID Research and Resources Group. Um, I'm Robert A. Rye from University of Wisconsin. And today I uh, will have a pleasure to learn about the role of droplets and aerosol in transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I'll just uh, write to say a few things for those who might not uh, be familiar with our, our webinars. Um, um, so this our webinar opens to everyone. So uh, if you are interested, you find them interesting, welcome to share with people that you know. Uh, it's really the main goal is to bring together physicists and other related scientists interested in COVID-related research. Uh, it's organized by APS COVID Research and Resources Group, CRRG. Uh, you're welcome to uh, join. Um, you can join uh, if you go to engageaps.org. Uh, it's again open to everyone, not just to APS members. If you have questions, just send an email to CRG. Um, uh, very quickly, I think I'm sure many of you have been to the first two webinars. Uh, we, we run them every two weeks. Uh, they range from one to one and a half hours. Today will be probably one, a little bit or between one hour to one hour and a um, and half. Uh, we have a presentation that's followed by a Q&A session. You can post questions anytime. Uh, we, we answer to these questions that are simple. We answer them uh, quickly. Uh, and then uh, some of the larger questions, more, um, more broader questions, we save them for our discussion later. Uh, we have Q&A and post-webinar discussion to CRG Engage. Uh, if you're interested, join there. And then recordings of the old webinars are available at CRG Engage, and as well as APS YouTube channel video. Um, we conducted post-webinar survey last time. Thanks to everyone who responded. Uh, we'll probably do it again, either this or next webinar. Uh, and uh, we're still analyzing the data, but thanks for all the feedback. It's really helpful. Uh, also, thanks for all the suggestions for future. We'd like to hear what we'd like to hear more about uh, because that helps our corrupt the program. So please sign up for the webinars uh, as you did for, for this one uh, and um, looking forward to the future ones. Here's just some of the next ones that will be really in, uh, more focused on the immune interactions and evolution and vaccines. Uh, so uh, will be a little bit different topics than today, uh, but uh, equally interesting. The same, I would just like to thank again to everyone who helps bringing this uh, to you. Uh, and with that, I will just like to hand over to Jose Luis uh, Jimenez, who is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. So I'm, I'm going to introduce Adrian. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to do so. Dr. Adrian Bax is a Dutch American molecular biophysicist and he did his bachelor's in applied physics at the Delft Institute of Technology in the Netherlands in 1978 and got his PhD at the same institution in 1981. He's the chief of the section on biophysical uh, NMR spectroscopy at the National Institutes of Health and has won many honors and awards. For example, he was the world's more, most cited chemist over two decades from 1980 to 2000. And in 2002, he was selected uh, to be a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So he's gonna to talk to us about what we know and what we don't know about the role of droplets and aerosols in the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Adrian. Thanks, Jose. Um, let me do the share screen thing here. They can get to it. Um, can you guys see this? Yep. Yes. All right. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, and it's a, uh, a pleasure to be able to uh, contribute, despite how unpleasant the motivation to, uh, for this series has been to all of us. Um, I knew absolutely nothing about the, to the topic that I'll be talking about uh, today uh, as of six months ago, and it's only because of this uh, crisis that I became interested in the topic. And, if you're worried about aerosol, uh, Jose really is the expert. So I'm a tad nervous here because he knows much more about this subject than I do. Uh, our own research and interest, as I mentioned, was uh, sparked by the uh, onset of the uh, current COVID crisis. And I hope to convince you that physics may actually hold a key to, to potentially mitigating and ending the pandemic. Uh, the work I'll be talking about today was uh, a close collaboration with my colleague, Philip Enferud, 
who spends much of his regular research time at the Argonne synchrotron collecting uh, uh, images and, and data, uh, X-ray data, I should say. His associate, uh, Valentin Stadnitsky, and my daughter, uh, who's a fourth year med uh, student, who came home for a couple of months when the medical school in Pennsylvania closed and helped and joined our team in, in the work that I'll be describing. Um, others that I should acknowledge briefly, um, Feng Li was a former postdoc, now a professor in Wuhan, and she was actually the first to point out that she didn't know how the virus was being transmitted because she told me there's no coughing or sneezing, but everybody's getting sick. Uh, my wife of 34 years, Ingrid Kufal, pointed to the, uh, the known fact that speech droplets are abundant and uh, could be infectious. And we were slightly frustrated to see that there was no mention of speech droplets as a uh, transmission mechanism on the CDC website, even while for influenza it had been acknowledged. A close collaboration ongoing with Professor Kushanagar at Gallaudet. And I am indebted to my friend Harold Varmus, who went out on a limb and endorsed our, uh, our early results, uh, getting any kind of credibility when there was so much noise early on during the pandemic um, was difficult and wouldn't have worked without, without this help. And then many others have been involved, in, particularly in the early aspects of, of our work. Uh, one disclaimer here, although I work at the NIH, I do not hold a medical degree and I don't speak for the NIH, all right? So don't attribute anything I say to the NIH. I could get in trouble. Uh, two more acknowledgements here. Uh, two group members, Yang Xian, who's been the, uh, working primarily on the computational analysis of the images. Uh, very sophisticated, very nice work he's been doing on that. And Joseph Courtney, who was key in actually building our detector system after uh, that involves now a blue laser instead of the green laser that you'll see towards the end of my talk. Uh, this is actually, uh, let me briefly expand on this. This is actually a steel box encased in uh, thermal insulation. Most of it comes from Home Depot. Uh, there's two speaker ports that we use for entering droplets into the box, an upper one and a lower one. And we'll come back to that uh, later. And the camera is situated at the back of this box, all right? And the camera is used for observing the images. Uh, some literature that I'll be heavily relying on. Many of the slides are stolen from those papers here, and you'll be able to look it up. It's very, very uh, insightful work. And those were key. There's many other important publications. One particularly, well, one mention here, this textbook by William Wells back in 1955, actually before I was born. I think if this were part of the regular med school curriculum, the pandemic never would have developed to the extent that it has. There's a lot of good knowledge in this that has been apparently completely forgotten and sort of frustrating. Another very gem of a paper that I'd like to point you to is uh, Daniel Musher's uh, mini review in the New England Journal of Medicine. And communicating with, with Daniel, he sort of made it clear to me that once the infection, the COVID infection starts in the upper respiratory tract, then the race is on. And what he means with that, it's the race between the virus that descends to the lower respiratory tract, that is your lungs, and your immune system that is trying to ramp up. So as long as your immune system is ramped up before the virus gets to your lungs, you're good to go. If the virus enters your lungs at the first stage, you could be in deep, deep trouble. And it's a little bit like a real estate. It's location, location, location. When the virus locates in your upper respiratory tract, it doesn't do a whole hell of a lot of harm. You lose your smell, you may get a sore throat, you get a headache, but you're not gonna be deadly sick. But once it descends into your lungs, you could be in serious trouble. Um, early videos that we brought out, it's like, to alert the people to the evidence of speech droplets, they're highly abundant. You can see what Phil Anferud emits here when he speaks behind a bundle, a, B, a sheet, I should say, of laser light. And one colleague sort of uh, jokingly said, well, don't speak like Phil does. Uh, sorry, we all do, as you see here in this image. This image actually was hard to get. You might say as a physicist, oh, duh, why don't you indeed 
try this with many persons. When we first published the data, it was only for Phil. The reason for this is if you're working at a med school or at a medical institution, this could be considered as human subject research. And as a physicist, you probably never heard of that. For us, it is a big red flag because that's tightly controlled. If you want to study multiple human subjects, you got to make sure to include a diverse array of people. They meet all kinds of criteria. There's an institutional review board and an approval process for it. In the end, we ended up getting a waiver for this. These droplets were declared as discarded objects. So we're just studying discarded objects. We're not studying people. And we were able to get the waiver eventually uh, to allow to publish this kind of data. Uh, here is actually the video clips that uh, those were taken from those images. And you can see- Spit happens. See Phil speaking. Spit happens. Spit happens. Spit happens. Spit happens. Okay. Spit happens. And you see the enthusiasm of our youngest member of the team. Um, Spit happens. Another thing that we showed early on is that we can stop those droplets from entering the atmosphere very easily with a mask. And this was in March. Remember, masks were strongly discouraged because there wouldn't be enough masks for the medical community. But what Phil here is showing that even just a paper towel can stop the vast majority of the droplets from entering the atmosphere, all right? They're gonna get stuck in his, in his paper towel or we've used a washcloth in our earliest demonstration. Now, this may not be good enough to stop the smallest of droplets like breathing or droplets produced by the vocal cords from entering the atmosphere, but many of the larger droplets that have a large volume fraction will get stopped by primitive uh, cloth kind of masks. Uh, a warning to the students, the kind of experiments I'll be talking about today are actually very easy to do. You go, you buy one of those lasers for 60 bucks on eBay and you go to Home Depot and for a few hundred dollars, you can rig something together like what I'll be, be using for much of my talk. Uh, a warning, this is not a toy, all right? This thing puts my deck on fire in a matter of seconds. You see the smoke coming off the deck that's being lit up by the laser beam here. This is not a toy. Be very, very careful when you play with this kind of stuff. Um, to start with the end of my talk, uh, give you some of the, uh, I've got, since I'm in the medical world, call them speculative conclusions. Uh, if you're a physicist, you would just say conclusions and whether they're right or wrong, you worry about, let somebody else worry about it. Uh, breathing and speech particles are far more numerous than uh, previously assumed. Many speech droplets, or most of them, the vast majority stays airborne for minutes, but not for hours. That means that indoors, there really is no safe physical distance. Nose breathing is far safer than mouth breathing. The dehydration of droplets, that is their ability to become airborne is far more complex than we had previously imagined. There might actually be something that is known as liquid-liquid phase separation is one of the hottest topics in cell biology. Um, infectivity may depend on humidity. There's two separate types, upper and lower respiratory tract infection. And you could actually infect yourself potentially, all right? To what extent that plays a role is still being investigated. And I hope to convince you that physics indeed can add a great deal to understanding the pandemic. Some facts about the virus, just to put us on a, on a somewhat sounder footing. I've uh, taken this data from uh, Ron Milo's very insightful paper in eLife. eLife is to us sort of what physics today is to many of you. And uh, this, this uh, very beautiful little paper contains many of the facts that you'd like to know as a physical scientist. First, it has a nice cartoon picture of what the virus looks like. It has the spike protein that all of you probably know about that is going to interact with a receptor protein that is normally involved in blood pressure regulation, the ACE2 enzyme that can bind to the spikes on the coronavirus. The spike protein needs to get cleaved by another enzyme, a protease. There's two different types around. That whole process takes about 10 minutes, binding and entering into the cell. Once it's entered, this thing needs to unwrap itself. It needs to prepare its machinery and create babies. 
All right, that takes 10 hours. And it keeps on producing progeny for about 24 to 40 or so hours, not in a burst, but they come out gradually at a rate of about 40 or so variants per hour. Um, we've got about 100 billion host cells in, in the lungs. You got about a billion host cells in the epithelial layer in your nose and your upper, upper throat. The volume of a host cell is about a thousand femtoliters or a picoliter. The virus itself turns out to be much, much smaller. And saliva sputum contains anywhere between a billion and 10 to the fifth billion, a million, I should say, copies of this virus per milliliter of saliva or sputum. Um, interesting thing that I'll briefly comment on uh, in a few minutes. There's a mutation in this virus where one of the amino acid aspartate 614 gets replaced by a glycine residue. And that apparently has overtaken as the major strain in this virus. What the exact role of that is still being debated and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the image here of the virus, it shows something that is known as the nucleoprotein that sort of wrapped randomly around this string of nucleic acid inside of this uh, virus. The true story is a little bit more complex. The virus itself has a diameter of about a tenth of a micron. The volume is a thousandth of a femtoliter that is much, much, much smaller than uh, a typical cell. And of course, the number of variants per milliliter, if you would pack them bumper to bumper, would be about 10 to the 15th. But in typical mucus or saliva of a highly infected person, that is about five to 10 orders of magnitude lower. All right. So it's very dilute. Another thing to mention is that the virus is a dead object. It has no wings, it has no smell, it has no motor, it cannot move. It exits your mouth embedded in a heap of muck, really, literally. And muck stands really for mucus. Saliva and mucus make up 95 to 99% of the oral flu fluid or so, uh, so, um, that, uh, of the droplets that enter and uh, that exit your mouth. Um, some cartoon view of the droplets that come out of your mouth with the virus embedded in it. As I stole this from Jose's uh, website, um, this is really an incorrect depiction. He correctly points out uh, a more accurate or a less, less incorrect as he calls it, depiction looks more like this. It's a very, very tiny virus embedded in a humongous droplet that is microns in diameter. And this thing is, is nanometers, right? The consistency of this droplet is 95 to 99% water, some protein, salt, and importantly, there is some phospholipid in it. And I will come back to that later on and a sprinkle of virus. Um, this is closer to my regular day job. And I said that virus contains proteins and we had those beads wrapped around the string of nucleic acid. It turns out it's not random wrapping. Those nucleocapsid protein are very carefully arranged. This is taken from a paper by a colleague of mine in Taiwan using NMR spectroscopy to sort of observe how those proteins pack. And in the HIV virus, they form a very nice carefully shaped cone, more like an acorn looking kind of object with the nucleic acid carefully wrapped inside that. So the wrapping of the nucleic acid inside the virus turns out to be very, very important. Um, the reason why it's important, it's known in the medical community that the amount of virus in saliva or stool slowly drops after a person is infected. It stays around for weeks, but the infectivity, as you've heard in the news perhaps lately, the infectivity very rapidly drops and within a couple of or about five days to a week, there is no culturable virus left in the sputum. And 
a hypothesis, my own perhaps wacky hypothesis is that it relates to incorrect packaging by this nucleocapsid protein, a little bit like if the virus or the cell that is wrapping up the virus and sending it into the world is in a hurry because it feels the pressure of the immune system, it no longer wraps it up carefully enough, sort of like, like you and me, perhaps on Christmas Eve, you feel the pressure, you're getting in a hurry, you don't do the careful packaging of your Christmas gifts, in this case, the variants. Um, other things that, that are closer to my normal natural work is understanding the effect of mutations. There's a beautiful paper by my colleague Gerhard Hammer that just came out in, in science last week that explains how a mutation could impact the flexibility that is important for the virus to enter the host cell. Closer to today's topic then, the epithelial layer in the respiratory tract in your lungs looks something like this, a layer of skin cells with little hairs on top of it. Those hairs are known as cilia, and there's really two layers of mucus. There's a low viscosity and a high viscosity layer, and those hairs are actually motor driven and serve to send this upper layer out of your respiratory tract, clean out any dirt that has gotten trapped in here, any aerosol, any virus, get it on its way out into your mouth. You can swallow it, you can spit it out, you can do whatever, and it won't get the chance to enter here. But of course the virus does, a small fraction of virus succeeds and manages to get into your cell and makes you sick. A rare case where the actual picture, electromicroscopy picture looks actually prettier than the cartoon itself, more impressive. You see the cilia here and the virus. This is a zoomed in image of the virus. Um, it, this is a black and white picture, of course, electron microscopy makes black and white images, can be color coded by an artist. And you see here the red objects are the viruses that sometimes can cluster that may or may not be important for infectivity. Um, but you can see the viruses here at the surface after they've exited an infected cell. Um, the thing that got us going six months ago was the realization that infectivity is maximum before the onset of symptoms. So this is a simulated, came out of a science paper. I, I, I picked this picture as a function of time after the virus enters uh, your body. And about five days after you become infected, before you have symptoms, there is a massive amount of virus transmissibility by asymptomatic carriers or people that haven't developed symptoms yet. So no cough and no sneezing, but we can infect people. And that was what basically inspired Phil Anferut and myself to make this little YouTube video asking or trying to answer what we call the trillion dollar question is how can we emit virus? And our hypothesis was that it would be speech droplets rather than breathing droplets. And I'll come back to that. Both in principle could do this. Breathing droplets turn out to be key for diseases like tuberculosis. Um, but without a lower respiratory tract infection, it was hard to believe how that could happen. Uh, our original image that we, we posted in the, in the YouTube video looked sort of like this, where we see droplets, speech droplets coming out of this guy's mouth and plastering the face of the neighbor that he's talking to, all right? So going back and forth here, right? Um, but only the largest droplets will be able to make it this far. And if this were the dominant mechanism, outside would be as bad as inside. And it's well known by now that inside is much more dangerous than outside, all right? So this image clearly isn't quite correct. Although we do know that outside transfer does happen as well. Um, a little kitchen experiment that actually Christina did for me uh, by uh, rinsing her mouth with, with concentrated food dye that turned out to be somewhat harder to get rid of afterwards than she anticipated. Um, speaking loud for about five or six minutes, I had in, in anticipation ruled out the ruler all the way six feet, but all the droplets turned out to be within a couple of feet of the end of the countertop. And after looking with a magnifying glass, we can find at most a couple of hundred that landed after six minutes. And that 
turns out to confirm the old studies from about a century ago that had concluded the same thing, that those droplets, large droplets are few and far between, and most of them don't, do not land on your countertop. So back to the laser lab. This is Phil Enfrew's laser lab. Uh, we're gonna use this sheet of laser light to observe droplets that go into a dark box here. Um, it's very bright light. And you can see that when you stick your hand in it, but in a dark environment, unless this laser light uh, hits something, you're not gonna see it. If it hits speech droplets, they will light up like little sparks in your uh, visible by your camera. Uh, so first, first time that we try to, to view this and uh, make a little YouTube video out of it. Uh, this is what it uh, looked like. And this was posted on YouTube and subsequently- Stay healthy. You're listening to Phil. Great. Stay healthy. No mask on his face and you see the Great. droplets. Less loud. Stay healthy. And I'm just being the movie director yeah. here. Repeating this, repeating this with a mask. Louder. Uh, Stay healthy. That's a washcloth. Stay healthy. Nothing. And you see there's nothing coming out of his mouth. All right. So uh, this convinced a lot of people, but it's hard again to get the attention. And we were encouraged to, to publish this. And actually uh, this, this appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine within a few weeks after we uh, did those measurements. Obviously a bit of a rush job for which we apologize, but Stay. It, it was intended to alert the, the general public that speech droplets are very, very numerous. Um, how numerous we counted here and how many droplets we could observe per frame of the video. This was a 60 frame per second video. And you count as many as 300 of those little sparks per frame of the video. The very few duplicates between adjacent frames in the video. So you can add them all up and it's about a thousand or so droplets per second of speaking. The green part is where uh, Phil was talking. The gray is where he was quiet. We still see droplets hanging around. It never returns to baseline. The longer you wait, actually the higher the baseline goes because droplets stay airborne. It was difficult to get that into the original uh, paper. We had it hidden in the uh, figure caption because it wasn't compelling and quantitative enough for the editors to go out on a limb and say, this is airborne. And airborne, of course, is a, is a scary word. And even now, uh, WHO and CDC are only reluctant to acknowledge that the virus hangs around for a long time. This is the same trace when speaking with a washcloth in front of Phil's mouth. Um, we're not the only ones making pretty videos. This is a particularly nice video that just came out in physics, uh, PhysRef uh, fluids from guys at Princeton. And you see how droplets at the lips are gonna get uh, generated. It's a uh, high speed camera and look carefully what's gonna happen with his lips when I hit go here. You see the droplets flying off his lips. Some are large, some are small. Let me run that again. It's really spectacular little video. Here they go, right? Those guys actually showed that if you put lipstick on, a balm on your lips, they call it, you reduce the number of fluids because you reduce the surface tension and you're gonna reduce, uh, make less spray. But more interestingly, the mechanism that they show here in this video that they very nicely demonstrate is that when you part your lips, you're gonna draw a little film between the lips that's gonna burst and create those droplets that start flying, all right? Now, what happens at the, the vocal folds, sometimes referred to as the vocal cords, that's by people that don't understand anatomy, they're really vocal folds. I get yelled at when I use the term vocal cords, so call them vocal folds, that's what they are. Here shown for a patient because it's it's very nice image of the vocal folds, some guy that has a polyp on it uh, or nodules. These guys come to close together and they get pulled apart by muscles. You got four muscles controlling this that control the frequency at which those guys open and close this valve. And air gets pushed through it. And obviously by modulating the airstream, we make an acoustic sound 
typically the bass frequency about a couple of hundred hertz that can get modulated with overtones to make various frequencies. And it's those muscles here, the arytenoids that are responsible for that. Amazing work from almost a dozen years ago was actually managed to make synthetic vocal folds and measure the airflow, image it directly and of particular interest, the airflow here at the surface, this narrow opening that gets to be as large as a millimeter is somewhere between 15 and 45 meters per second that translate into Reynolds numbers that you may be more interested and familiar with of anywhere between 100, that is laminar flow, or as high as 10,000, which is very far into the turbulent range, all right? So now we get interested flow dynamics where you guys get all excited. Uh, back to the epithelium. This is what is at the surface of both the vocal folds and the respiratory tract, the cilia that I pointed to, and the high viscosity layer. So whether the droplets form by shearing off some of this layer here, like for example, a, a, a breezy day at the ocean where you might feel ocean spray, or whether it is the vocal folds pulling apart like the lips did in the Princeton video is still not quite clear. But in either case, it does generate those droplets of mucus and uh, saliva, oral fluid that covers the epithelial layer. Uh, another cartoon view here indicating to you what the size scale is. It's about five microns between the cell, the, the actual uh, skin, so to speak, and the surface of your, your mucus. And here shown for a laminar flow, uh, flow profile of the air that goes over it. Now your lungs, breathing droplets, presumably have a very different mechanism. And I took this from another paper from about a dozen years ago. You got little channels in your lungs that connect the alveoli to your bronchi that are covered again with this mucosal layer. And through surface tension, this can collapse and cause a restriction. Of course, the air pressure will burst open this restriction and can generate a breathing droplet in the process. It will be very small. The whole channel is only a couple of microns in diameter. So your droplets, by definition, cannot be larger than a couple of microns in their fully hydrated state. And if there is virus in your lungs, only if there is virus in your lungs, I want to emphasize, would there be virus in the droplet that's gonna fly out of your little bronchial tube? Now those droplets will dehydrate once they end up in the air. This is beautiful work that was published just two years ago by uh, my colleagues, Federano and uh, Lindsay Marr at Virginia Tech. That's where Lindsay is. She's done a lot of other cool work. Um, you see what they're showing, they're studying those droplets here on a very hydrophobic surface. And she's made synthetic droplets like I would have by taking some salt, some protein and water. And the smart thing she did was she studied it with and without some phospholipids present. This is called with is 4C without is 3C, and this is human saliva, that's the real thing. So you put those droplets on a very hydrophobic surface, there's a very small droplets, 20 micron bar here. You dry them, and you'll find that in the absence of this small amount of phospholipid, they dry out very rapidly, they follow the ideal dehydration kinetics, and they become very small, typically about a factor of five less in diameter if they're starting out as a 1% volume fraction of stuff that is in, in, in the water droplet. Now, adding just a tiny amount of phospholipid changes the dehydration uh, kinetics. And what you see for human saliva, they almost don't dry out at all three minutes later, all right? So intriguing. Um, she proposes that this might be related to phase separation. If you slowly dehydrate a droplet, the contents of it may be able to separate and it could form an impervious layer on the surface. Whereas if you rapidly dehydrate it, it doesn't have time to demix. And you could end up with an amorphous droplet that is very different and very much more strongly dehydrated. Here you could trap 
the water inside this shell of organic matter that ends up on the outside. Uh, she has some other data supporting this, that if you fluorescently tag the droplets, you see this on the surface, in the absence of phospholipid, they dehydrate if she slowly lowers the humidity. If she adds a small amount of DPPC, the phospholipid, they don't dehydrate nearly as much. And this comes back in our videos, we show the same thing, that those, um, those droplets only dehydrate if you dehydrate them rapidly, not if you do so slowly. Key question, is the virus gonna be infectious after the droplet has dehydrated? The answer is, is yes for most viruses, not by definition really, but this is an old cold coronavirus where those studies were done uh, more than 20 years ago. And you can show that uh, the virus stays highly infectious an hour after it enters the atmosphere, provided the relative humidity is low, not necessarily so when the relative humidity is high. All right, now for the polio virus, a different kind of virus, it's exactly the opposite. So there's no a priori answer to say, oh yes, that's a dumb question. No, for some viruses like the coronavirus or the influenza virus, the virus stays highly infectious, even more so when it rapidly dehydrates. This is one of the original papers, 1985, where they showed this, how rapidly at the, at the high humidity, the virus loses infectivity. And at low humidity, again, this is the, the regular cold coronavirus stays perfectly infectious. Uh, I also, like I pointed out earlier, droplet science is really old, goes back a hundred years. Important stuff those guys did, particularly related to large droplets, they showed that the volume is very large. They carefully counted all of this. They couldn't count the small droplets as nice as we can these days. So they missed out on the smallest of droplets, but all the larger droplets were characterized very accurately and very, uh, very well quantified. And as you can see here, the very largest droplets make up for a very big volume fraction. And even some of those don't land on your countertop. That's the percentages that land on your countertop. And anything less than 100 microns, very few will end up on the countertop and stay airborne, at least for close to a minute or longer. Uh, these days, people have focused more on, on smaller droplets using aerosol type technology. I won't dwell on this. This is actually hard when looking at liquid droplets. It's more made for solid aerosol, but uh, conclusions were uh, largely unambiguous in the sense that the number of droplets increases with the loudness of speech in a, in a very steep manner. The size distribution doesn't really change very much as a function of loudness. So uh, that, that is consistent with what we observe in our lasering uh, light scattering measurements, just that the numbers that were observed with their technology turned out to be about two orders of magnitude lower in terms of small droplets than what we see with, with laser light scattering. But many of the other conclusions are perfectly in sync with what we observe. So back to observing droplets directly with laser light. Um, this is uh, Phil's box where we're gonna try to observe we, uh, fr from the front. He's gonna insert droplets from the back. What you're seeing here is this box under construction after spraying some droplets, in this case, containing orchid food that he had taken from his wife's spray bottle, uh, not knowing that it didn't contain the distilled water that he had put in there originally. And for a minute after spraying into this box, you can see those bright particles of aerosol of the salt orchid food floating through this box. Of course, there's many, many, many of them here. When you speak into the box, there's gonna be far fewer and it's only a very small volume fraction of the total box that we're gonna be observing, okay? A very small fraction of 1%. So we're gonna put the front cover on this box, speak into the back of the box and count the number of particles that we see. The whole thing needs to be done in, a, uh, in an atmosphere that is free of dust. Normally it would be done in a clean room, which we don't have, but he has this HEPA filtered uh, area sealed off by curtains. And after a couple of minutes, this is totally dust free. Uh, speaking into the box, we can count with a camera. We project here um, a total of, of six seconds 
eight seconds of 60 frame per second frames on top of one another. We count the numbers of particles per frame. Typically at the start, after speaking for about 30 seconds, he observed, we observed nine, nine particles in the observed window, 30 milliliters, a total box volume, 200 liters. So you multiply it up, you know how many particles he has produced. And we see this in the number of particles that light up decay as a function of time. The small particles have a longer time constant. They scatter less light. So the smaller they decay in, in our measurements with a time constant of about 14 minutes. And we just put it in two bins, obviously. The bright particles decay faster with a time constant of about eight minutes. And depending on how you partition it, this time constant is faster or slower. But clearly those particles don't rapidly fall to the bottom of the box. And that's in a very, very quiet environment. Imagine what's happening in your, your canteen, if you're speaking, where the air is moving around, people are moving around. Uh, those particles will hang around even longer. Uh, back to breathing. We couldn't see any breathing particles early on, but now with the more sensitive detector, the blue laser, we can easily see exhaled breath particles. These are now much smaller, but they're still hydrated, all right? They're fully hydrated. I monitor them just when they come out of my mouth and they enter the laser sheet of light. And as you can see, they sort of form a cloud. They're not uniformly distributed. That's because the air hangs together. This is a frame of a 120 frame per second video uh, with a four millisecond shutter time to reduce motion artifacts. So you see them as nice crisp particles of different levels of brightness. This is without mask. This is with a conventional surgical mask, not an N95. And you see it cuts it down by about a factor of two or three. So even while those droplets are small, we can do a decent job on reducing them. I can do the same thing, but instead of just breathing, I say, ah, and take a video of that. And now I've got a mixture of breathing and vocal fold droplets. Again, we can stop the vast majority of them, but not all of them because they're so small that many of them come through the mask. Uh, the larger droplets that would come from my, from my lips are totally blocked by the cloth mask, uh, by contrast. Um, looking at those droplets, um, like I'd like to show you is they, they're numerous. There are many, many, many of them. You already saw that from the previous picture, but I'd like to show you a, a live image. I'm gonna fill the top of my box, that steel box I showed you at the beginning with this loud ah sound. Well, first I'm gonna fill it with breathing droplets. Let's do that first. I just breathe in the top of my box and I start a little video here. Oh. All right, I did, I did my best. I filled the top of the box with breathing and sound. And it took, waited for 20 seconds and here they come. They're falling down to the lower part of the box where my camera is uh, located in the laser light sheet here. And you see they're falling into the laser stream of light. There are weak ones that fall slowly. There's bigger ones that presumably come off the focal folds that drop faster. Interestingly, you see them flash. I'll come back to that in a second. Those bright ones, it's like they light up and become less, less bright. And slowly, if I wait long enough, they're gonna fill the whole box evenly. And at, in, if I wait for another five minutes, you see they're evenly distributed. And many of them don't move anymore because they're so light, they just float. Those are the breathing particles. The larger ones still slowly descend and we can actually measure the rate at which they fall. And from that, get a, through Stokes law, get a measure for actually how large they are. Uh, I mentioned they flashed. People keep on asking me why they flash. My laser light beam, this is a cheap laser. It's made of many diodes and it's not a homogeneous sheet. This is projecting the sheet on a very, at a very shallow angle on a uh, dark piece of cardboard. And you get the cross section here, a blow up of the cross section. You see the dark and light areas. And obviously when you hit one of the dark spots with your uh, droplets, it's gonna go dark and it lights up again when it drops. Now, if we repeat the same droplet generation at low humidity, this, the last one was at 90% relative humidity, when the droplets really don't seem to dehydrate. If I do it at 
30% humidity. Do the same thing. And I wait, I'm gonna wait for 30 seconds now before anything happens. And all you see is those tiny guys, look very carefully, those tiny guys entering the sheet here. And they're barely visible. I'm just trying to add some speed spikes. I got, that I got impatient. They're saying stupid stuff. Like spit happens. DJ, take care. You see, I got impatient, started filling the box with, with larger speed droplets and those big flashes coming through the screen are the bigger droplets that came out of my lips, not off the focal folds. And let's try to look at those just in a frame by frame way. This is one of those large guys coming into the field of view. Next frame, I can measure the length, next frame, and here it exits the field of view. I can measure the size, three and a half centimeters in a 40 millisecond time. Stokes law gives me a diameter of about 183 microns for this particular droplet, all right? The intensity of those guys I can also get from measuring the intensity of my, my, my droplets. This is the convection speed at which the air moves by looking at how fast the smallest droplets move. Yang Xian made this very nice analysis. I can subtract that from the others and I can measure how fast those other small droplets that were slowly descending in that earlier movie, how fast they're dropping. That's expected to scale linearly with the integrated intensity of the light. And it's roughly linear, as you can see. I can extrapolate them to very smaller sizes and we can get an estimate for droplet size all the way down from half a micron all the way up to 200 microns. That's really almost eight orders of magnitude in volume for those droplets. Like I mentioned, we're not the only one making pretty, uh, pretty movies. This one is particularly nice. It's really very impressive. I'll, uh, I'm gonna show it to you here. Um, it just came out and it's without sound. It's a, a high, high speed camera. And what you see here is the guy doing this, the stone ladder do ray, and you see the ray is not doing very much, coming out with me, also not very much. Now he's gonna do fa, it's the teeth hitting the lips. And look what happens, an explosion of particles here. They measure the speed for all of those particles with tracking, with, uh, tracking uh, algorithm. It's absolutely stunning uh, little video that gives you a feel for what's really happening. And those droplets, they stay around really for minutes uh, to a good fraction of an hour. And if there are virus in them, that's of course bad news. Um, importantly, as, as my friend Donald Milton pointed out, we have different sizes of droplets. You have the ballistic ones that could hit your face across the fence outside. The other guys, less than 100 microns can still be inhaled, but gonna get stuck in your nose or perhaps your upper throat. The less than 10 to 15 microns that could contain a lot of virus because they have a large volume can also end up in your upper respiratory tract, but not in your lungs. And then there's the smallest guys that come off the vocal folds or breathing generated that can directly descend into your lungs. The volume of those is very small, but you're long, exposed long enough to them, you may actually get them inside your lungs where they can do a lot of damage. Uh, beautiful uh, apparatus. I mean, you got to love this as a physicist. This is Don Milton's uh, G2. He pledged to send this to the Smithsonian soon. He's got the newer version of this uh, in progress right now of being constructed, but uh, fantastic apparatus. Another one that you got to love here. This guy, this is a Dutch-Belgian study where he climbs into this box and has culture trays set out. He can do this with mask, without mask and measure how culturable the virus is. And they did this for Pseudomonas and could show that masks really help in spreading and emitting the amount of virus that comes out of a speaker's mouth. Um, is there an infectious threshold? Uh, a big fundamental question. It is known from wound healing, for example, uh, that if you have a high local dose of, of bacteria, you can overwhelm the immune system. 
Similarly, for aspirational pneumonia, my friend uh, Daniel Mushiers pointed out and published on this, this uh, uh, topic, if you inhale your own bacteria that are present in your mouth at night when you're asleep, through a process known as aspiration, they land in your lungs and you can actually get pneumonia from that. Now, as is clear to you and all of us now, after listening to this, this presentation, I hope, Respiratory virus comes in units of one, all right? Typically it would be one drop, one variant or a couple of variants per droplet. And many of those are defective variants. So even if you have a hundred in a droplet, likely only one of them is actually infectious and correctly packaged with the nucleocapsid protein and able to enter the human host cell. So it's a little bit like, throwing uh, food packages out of the space station uh, into your, your backyard, they're gonna end up all over the country and not all at the same site when you inhale droplets. And obviously, whether you start out with one food package and you've got exponential growth or you start out with 10, very quickly, this and this gives the same number of variants in your upper respiratory tract, all right? So those guys each are gonna create a thousand progeny that are now very close to neighboring cells and able to infect with much higher infectivity go into their neighbors. Um, a reason why I believe, and I don't wanna insult my medical colleagues, uh, but why they are hung up about this threshold model is that invariably those dose response is shown on a log scale for the horizontal axis, all right? If you plot the same data on a linear scale, this is what it looks like, all right? The chance of getting infected approaches one in an exponential manner. So it's normally expressed in units of quanta. This goes back again to, uh, to Wells and Riley, um, very well researched and uniformly accepted. Uh, used by the risk uh, community, risk analysis community that is consistently ignored by the medical community. Apologies to my medical colleagues. This beautiful work, in particular by my colleague Haas at Drexel University, uh, was published on this, was shown for the coronavirus. This is uh, the original SARS coronavirus, a dose response curve that looks nicely sigmoidal, yes, but as he points out, it fits this linear model that's frequently referred to as the exponential model, the single hit model, or the independent action hypothesis, all different terms for the same, uh, same idea. Um, now, question that I then get asked is why does higher dose give you more severe disease? And that's quite well known, quite widely recognized. If you're heavily exposed, you're more likely to get serious disease. And of course, to us, the answer is obvious because the more virus, with certainty you're gonna get infected in your upper respiratory tract, but the chance of getting a direct infection of your lower respiratory tract goes up. It's small to begin with, but the more virus you're exposed to, the chance that you get directly rather than indirectly infected in your lungs goes up dramatically with those. So there's other ways of infecting your lungs. And this is normally thought to happen through a process known as micro aspiration, like I, I mentioned before, that you're sucking in your own droplets at night. This is known to occur traced by radioactive uh, tracers here. And most of it will end up in your stomach. This is done in overnight sleep studies. You see it coming down the esophagus and sometimes the stuff ends up in your lungs. How often this happens is a little bit debated. If you drip this overnight in somebody's lungs, it could be as much as 50% of the patients that show something in their lungs. On the other hand, people in Japan show that if you tie it to the teeth, people that suffer from aspiration pneumonia are very likely to aspire and get this sucked into their lungs. But normal healthy controls are much less likely and about 10% of the controls showed radioactivity in the lungs. So how widely, how often, and how uh, much aspiration contributes is not known. A potential hypothesis is that when you're speaking and you've got an upper respiratory tra uh, tract infection, you could emit those droplets 
and you're exposed to yourself, you're exposing yourself to your own droplets that rapidly dehydrate if they come off the vocal folds and you can inhale them and get them right into your lungs and make you sick much more in a hurry than if you were to wait for this stuff or for the aspirational process to happen. Now, self-infection would be prevented by masks, just like emission of any droplets. And we all know how uh, controversial this topic is because many people don't like masks, right? Um, and we all know about this and have seen this many, many times. Uh, it's sad, but it's true. Um, I hope I've convinced you of the conclusions that I already spelled out to you previously. Some open remaining questions. Primarily, how do breathing droplets contribute? And can carriers without symptoms contribute to this? The dehydration kinetics remains a very interesting question to physics. And uh, I believe that indeed physics has a lot more to contribute uh, than, than many had, had thought it did. And at this point, I realize I've, I've used already more time than I intended, and I should open up the discussion. Thanks very much. And I should stop the share screen. Thank you, Adrian, for an excellent presentation. And we have some questions already in the, in the public forum. Um, so I think we, we should probably start, since you have an audience of physicists, they're curious about uh, your technical setup. So there were some questions about what wavelengths and powers of lasers you use, and what sizes of particles you can see in the different experiments, and what is the best anyone could do if they got the, the most expensive laser and, and detector and setup? Um, actually, I think we are almost at the, that's a lot of questions that at once to, to comment on, but um, <laughs> yes, Originally, when using a cell phone as a detector, Phil Anferud's uh, beloved iPhone, he thought this was the greatest of all uh, pieces of equipment. And actually, it's pretty good. You can, with an iPhone, you can get down to about a couple of microns and see particles scatter light with the setup he had using about four watts of optical laser power. Um, I'm using a Sony uh, camera, just a regular couple of thousand dollar camera from my neighbor. And that camera is actually getting us close to the limit of, I think, where we're interested in, where with a, again, a about four watt, 452 nanometer uh, blue laser, I can see particles scatter light uh, at a 24 frame per second down to a size of about a half a micron. And of course, as, as you know, Jose, you can go smaller and I, I can see smaller with, with my camera as well by uh, increasing the shutter time. And the more you increase your shutter time, the more crap you start seeing. It's really scary how dirty the air is that we're inhaling every day. And I was blissfully unaware, but of course you know this and that's where the aerosol community is, is uh, well tuned in. But all the stuff I was using is very trivial. Uh, a 452 nanometer blue laser, $60. Um, uh, a camera, Sony camera, Alpha S2, uh, which makes nice video. Um, all commercial, trivial stuff. Okay. Uh, your sound is mute right now, Let's, Jose. Jose is you already muted? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, people were also asking if uh, if you're sure that you're you're watching droplets that are coming out of people as opposed to to the water vapor in in your breath condensing on ambient particles, pre-existing uh, particles. Yes, interesting question actually. Um, be be hard to distinguish because they need very small particles could be floating in the air. And we know from observing that, that they do exist. The way we've got our box set up, we've got not a normal HEPA filter. We've got way, way better filters than that. So I can be sure that the particle content in my box is extremely low. And the number of breathing droplets that I observe doesn't depend on how well I filtered the air in my box. So yes, I could get condensation, but I see the condensation happening. Those, those images that you saw, the, the, the frozen images at 120 frames per second were done at very low humidity. 
of uh, about 20% relative humidity, where I didn't use any humidification. I normally come in at a humidity of 0%, all right, with totally dried air. So it's rather unlikely that this cloud that comes out of my mouth would absorb the aerosol floating in the box and nucleate that rapidly into such large particles, but not fundamentally impossible. So it's, it's, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, there was also some questions about um, how do you define aerosols versus droplets versus how they are defined in the infectious disease community? Have the sense that you just call everything a droplet as a, as a physicist would, which is maybe not what a doctor would say, right? Yes, yes, this is, this is a very important point, uh, Jose. Um, there's been a lot of confusion about this. Uh, the aerosol community, I guess your community frequently thinks about aerosol, about things that hangs around for days. Um, as, as Donald Milton points out, for from a disease perspective, we should really should call everything aerosol that hangs around for minutes. And mm -hmm. everything that is liquid coming out of your mouth will dry out or almost everything before it hits the, the countertop and therefore becomes aerosol. And you got aerosol that start out as a 100 micron droplet, transforms to 20 or 30 microns and really is aerosol because it hangs around for minutes. So from a medical perspective, we've got to consider all of that as being aerosol. Mm -hmm. um, there were questions about what would happen if you did these experiments outdoors with, with the wind? Uh, would, would, uh, would we see the particles go away very quickly? If, uh, if, you, if you were able to, assuming you were able to, to do this imaging outdoors. Yes, it's, it's again, a very important question, really. Um, those droplets, once they're in the air, they'll go exactly like smoke. If you were smoking a cigarette, fortunately, not many people do anymore, but you remember what happens when you, when you smoke. Uh, if you're standing right next to somebody or right in a smoke stream, you'll still get it in your face. And the same will happen with dried out speech droplets. On the other hand, we also know that outdoor smoking isn't that big a deal. They rapidly dilute and it's not nearly as bothersome. On the other hand, you can speak, uh, pick up the smell of marijuana from a mile away. Uh, there are droplets or airborne particles in the air uh, everywhere, very dilute, very unlikely to, to infect you, but nevertheless, not impossible. You can get hit by a meteorite too, you know, so you shouldn't fret too much about it, I think. Okay. Um, one other interesting question. Uh, is it known if these droplets are charged? They have a, a net electrical charge or are they neutral? Do you know? Uh, I really don't know. I'm going to ask you. You're the aerosol expert. <laughs> uh, what's going to happen after they come out of my mouth? Uh, yeah. What I do mean, you think? I, I, you know, I, I don't know for sure for these ones. It, it is known that often when you make particles out of uh, a fluid by these kind of surface tension processes, that you often end up with charges. That is, is kind of like a static electricity making procedure. So you often have some fraction that don't have a charge, some fraction have a negative charge, some fraction have a positive charge. But I'm not aware of, of studies for speech droplets and for well, speech aerosols. Well, if they carry a charge that would make it more effective, I presume, for N95 masks, would you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything that has a charge is much easier to we also scientists spend a lot of time trying to not lose particles that have a charge because they are used so easy. They're attracted by any static electricity and which is what N95 masks use. Yep. Uh, let's see. There, there were multiple questions about masks and different aspects of masks. Should we, well, why don't you give us your general take about, about masks? When, when should we wear them and well, what do they two, do? Two, two things, uh, masks, I believe are incredibly effective against emission of droplets. Just a simple cloth mask, almost everything works. Um, so cloth masks for preventing the virus from getting into your office, into the room, into the air, they're extremely effective. Now, how effective are they against inhaling? Probably not that great, all right? Um, Don Milton might be able to measure this. Other people have measured this. Um, they might protect somewhat, maybe 50%, not that great. But 
if everybody, if the whole bloody world were wearing a mask for a month, there would be no more pandemic. That's at least my somewhat naive, but contention, right? There's no more spread of virus. That's the end of the pandemic. Now, there are many reasons. So you've seen the, in one of my last slides why that's not gonna happen. Politics comes in, but I really can't imagine, I still can't comprehend why not everybody is willing to cover their face, it's not that big a deal, and wear a mask, all right? In particular against emitting virus, everybody thinks, oh, I am not sick, right? I feel perfectly healthy. That's not the issue. You're gonna feel perfectly healthy and emit virus if you've been exposed. Mm -hmm. So some additional questions. Do you have any thoughts on using commercial air purifiers to clean indoor air? And maybe your own experience cleaning up the air on your box may give you some clues about this one. <laughs> yes, yes, interesting question. And actually, uh, office contamination where things can build up and if you got bad ventilation is a problem. And in principle, an air purifier could do a great deal at purifying it. But as you know, and pointed out on your very nice website, uh, you're competing with air turnover. So your air hopefully will be refreshed in, in your, your office. So I think you should comment on quantitatively how difficult it is to, to clean your office or your lab by putting an air purifier that you buy at, at Home Depot into your office. What's your take? Well, I mean, I think it, it actually, it, it works well as long as the size of the purifier is sufficient for the room. So you kind of, what we are recommending is you want, so you have a room that has a volume of 25 cubic meters, then you want an air purifier that can clean at 125 cubic meters per hour, and then you are cleaning it five times an hour. What happens is people just buy an air purifier and they feel it's like a, you know, like a lucky, lucky thing. They put it there, but it's way too small. So it's cleaning too little air. I think that's, that's one practical problem because they're expensive. But there, there is this other type of air purifier thing which you use use basically literally tape an HVAC filter onto a fan, like a box fan, that actually also work very well and they're much cheaper. So we've been trying to get people to, to use those and, and, and save money. Uh, one other, one other, oh, can I, sorry. Can, can I just, just yeah. build a little bit on this? Uh, in yeah. terms of discussion, I kind of like re reflecting some of the questions that were there. I think, you know, the current recommendations of six feet or two meters in Europe, uh, are, should be replaced uh, with more um, area-based or volume-based uh, requirements, how much space somebody needs, you know, especially for the, for the winter months, um, you know, when the infinite space doesn't go. I think from your experience, Adrian, there's a lot of things that are really contained. So maybe the, the third dimension does not matter. But on the other hand, like because you, you were talking about, you know, purifiers like basically based on the volume that you have, holds irrelevant on the planes, for example. So what do you think? Should recommendations include the third dimension and volume, right? Just like single distance. Yeah, I, I want to defer this question to Jose because he spent a lot of time actually quantitatively analyzing this. And I love what he said about it on his website. It's really very much to the point. Well, uh, just quickly. Um, yes, I mean, really what you don't want to do is to breathe other people's exhaled air. So actually the, the shortcut is, is something like this, which is, um, of, you cannot see it if I put it there. It's a carbon dioxide analyzer, which costs you, you know, $150. And then you can see how much exhaled air is, is there in a room. So right now this is reading a thousand part per, part per million, a thousand twelve hundred. That means 2% of the air that I'm breathing is air that I'm breathing for the second time. It's used my air, so it doesn't matter so much, but if I were in an office, I don't want to be breathing 2% of everyone else's air. That's what's going to get you sick because this is just a tracer for them. Uh, for the aerosols that are going to be there. So, so yes, we have, we have to think about how to not breathe other people's air. That's kind of the, the key. Yeah, and then on top of that, I think like you point out is, it depends on the activity, right? So if somebody is speaking, if everybody is just sitting there quietly, not doing anything else, but breathing, if breathing, part of, breathing doesn't create any virus, unless I've got really sick people in a hospital ward, where of course there, if it's in the lower lungs, uh, the air would be very contagious, all right? But if I've got asymptomatic people, most of those will not have it without symptoms in their lungs. So normal breath wouldn't really be as big of a problem. But if there is activity like 
a teacher spraying virus all over the students, uh, that would create some problems. Or if I'm in an exercise class and I'm inhaling 10 times as much as when I'm sitting in my office, I'm going to be a lot more sensitive to small trace amounts of virus in the air because I'm going to suck them into my lungs right away because I'm inhaling very deeply through my mouth instead of filtering them through this nice labyrinth filter system in my nose. So it's complex, but the CO2 detectors are indeed a very, very nice way of seeing how much recirculated air you are ingesting, inhaling. And just if I may add something to that, that um, we, to that the, your point about the activity that we, when we look at the databases of super, super spreading events that now have thousands, we see many have happened in choirs, many have happened in bars, none that we could find have happened in movie theaters or in libraries, right? They happen where people are, are talking or yelling or singing because for the reasons you showed, this greatly increases the amount of, of respiratory aerosol. Yes, it's fascinating, fascinating. The absence of observation is actually- Very useful. Is positive evidence. So I think this is a very, very important point that the community has not realized yet. Mm -hmm. I know if Robert or Gian, you have other questions, otherwise I, I have a few more I can pull from the, from the chat. Yeah, so there was a question in the, in the QA, which was interesting. It says, is there a minimum, is there an understanding of a minimum infectious dose from an infected person? Um, or is that, is that too broad a question to answer? Well, it's actually an interesting question, and I sort of rushed over that a little bit when talking about this infectious threshold. And it's really the risk analysis people, the community that has their own journals and everything that has, has dealt with this. And the true answer is no, according to them, there is no threshold for viral diseases when we're dealing with a susceptible host, such like influenza or COVID-19 for humans. All right, those are two things, infectious, highly infectious particle and a susceptible host. Then it's just a matter of buying lottery tickets. The more you buy, the bigger the chance that you're gonna get infected and in, you inhale enough with all certainty, you're gonna get infected, all right? Mm -hmm. And look at the paper by, by, by uh, Charles Haas, for example, where he did this for uh, the SARS uh, virus. So no safe, perfectly safe threshold. It's a matter of probability. And there was another question that was interesting. Uh, they asked, are there specific languages where you emit more particles than you would with other languages? So which language should you speak and which one should you avoid? <laughs> Assuming you are multilingual. <laughs> My wife, uh, the linguist, uh, thought this was actually one of the most interesting questions. And I think by and large, it doesn't make that much difference because we all move our lips apart, our tongue, our teeth touch our lung, our lips, and we all have vocal cord vibrations. The it's more in the sociology of speech, I think, and see things that Italians will speak more than other Indian. cultures, yeah. right? Or in New York, they're gonna be speaking louder in some communities than in others. So yes, we're gonna, or in a bar, you're gonna be speaking louder than if you're in a very quiet reading room. So it's more the habit of speaking than the language per se, I believe. Although there might be some subtle differences. Mm -hmm. So and kind of like related uh, related question was um, you know obviously the size you showed very nicely how much the size matters uh, you know and then part of the question is uh, again going to um, to the question how far is far enough you know what's the impact on the humidity you know conditions and the amount but also in the terms of protection uh, is there like um, you know any any recommendation in terms of which particles are the ones that would be stoppable or not, or you would need to be uh, depending on the circumstances, just of the size, you know, and amount of virus in that that could be transmitted, et cetera. So uh, anything? Well, 
I, I only dare to comment. I don't want to make any recommendations because that's above my pay grade and I'm going to get yelled at by, by a lot of colleagues if I do so. The only thing I can say from observing experimentally what we see with our laser light scattering is that any type of mask is extremely effective at stopping emission. 99% or more, all right? Except, of course, what we can't easily measure, how much escapes from the side of your mask. And I think Jose made some very important point that fitting of your mask is more important than the type of material a mask is made of. If you sneeze or if you cough, the airflow volume, the instantaneous volume is humongous and you blow your mask off your face, right? A lot of it will escape. If I go, ah, there's not a lot of airflow and all of it goes through the mask. So the mask will be extremely effective. If I cough, I produce this burst and I blow the mask off my face and I still produce, uh, produce material in the air. So you gotta be very careful answering this question in, in black and white. And you know, uh, in, in some way, just the reverse question was like breathing uh, through mouth or through nose, you know, and we know that uh, obviously nose has a lot of mechanisms to, to break. Uh, but, you know, just to say you, you pass somebody and you try to breathe through mouth or is that something that uh, somebody should consider just in terms of the, um, you know, the pathway to differently or pay attention to how we breathe in, not just, you know. Uh, mo most definitely. There's actually nice literature on it uh, that apparently the amount of filtering of at least coarse particles and Jose, you might want to comment on that. I don't know how much the aerosol community considers this, but like as much as 90% gets captured in your, in your nasal cavity, all right? In this labyrinth, this really very nice uh, set of little channels that the air goes through. So mouth breathing, uh, I recommend against, even if myself, especially when exercising, get engaged in it because I need the amount of air. Uh, you throw away your filter and you open yourself up to direct infection of the lower respiratory tract, which is the worst kind of way of getting hit. Mm -hmm. Jose, what do you think about the filtering? I know, I, I, I agree with everything you said. That, that's why the labyrinth is there, to protect ourselves, I think, from, from infection. And, yep. Well, you still infect your upper respiratory tract, right? But that's the mild form of the disease. Yeah. Not so bad, mm -hmm. you're gonna survive it. You get mm -hmm. it directly in your lungs. Some people argue it's as bad as, as MERS or the original SARS with a 15% death rate rather mm -hmm. than the 1% that we're dealing with currently. Mm -hmm. um, so there was one question that, that caught my eye. Uh, someone was saying, how do masks contribute to reduce the risk of self-infection? So when you were talking about infecting from your upper to your lower, so, so it's like someone was saying, well, if you're wearing a mask, can you make it that more likely? <laughs> so what's your answer? <laughs> Actually, very, very, very interesting and good question. The droplets that you'd be generating would be coming off your vocal folds. They're going to get stuck in your mask. And even if you were to re-inhale them, they're still going to be too large. They're not going to end up in your lungs. And actually, empirically, people have found that wearing masks lowers the risk of serious disease. That's exactly the opposite of what we would be arguing as the effect of masks, because you would say, Wearing a mask is going to make it less likely that I'm going to get sick, but the smallest guys are going to pass through the mask and going to end up in my lungs and I'm going to get very sick. That's not what's being observed. So self-infection does not happen if you wear a mask, all right? Because then you would see this serious illness. So just this intuitive picture that you cannot inhale your own vocal cord droplets or that they get stuck in your mask must be correct. Otherwise, the empirical evidence would go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And we're still trying to prove this with a, the collaboration with Gallaudet is involved in that to get statistical significance on actually putting hard numbers behind this self-infection hypothesis. It's obvious that it is true, but quantitatively, how much it contributes, 1% or 50%, or of this pathway that is really not known. Mm -hmm. 
So any, um, so I should say that there is still several questions that are unanswered. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll able to convince Adrian to maybe answer some offline. Uh, we'll try to post them on the CRG website. Uh, but I think based on the interest that we hear today, um, I think we'll we'll try to have more uh, webinars on this topic. Uh, so um, I would like to thank again uh, Adrian for a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. I think the I think you convinced everyone that maybe have not been convinced that it really, really matters. Uh, and I think Cozelle is, I think was great um, uh, moderating, I think, uh, and looking forward to maybe hearing from you once the future about more of the aerosols. I think there's a lot of interest that you've seen. Uh, but uh, at the same time, again, like thanks Jan for, for helping with this. I would like to invite everyone in two weeks time. Uh, and then as I mentioned for the next two, we'll be focusing on on the immune aspects, and I think especially with the incoming uh, vaccines, I think there will be a lot of interest. You know how our body fights and what we can do uh, with vaccines to to help in case we we don't wear a mask and and get infected. So, <laughs> thank you everyone for attention, and uh, see you at the next webinar. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thanks, thank thanks you. guys. Bye.